Hello friends, I'm Matt, and like you, I've had a lot of downtime recently. For me, given downtime, I tend to read up on things. Most recently, I've been reading up on the psychopath test, which on the surface seems incredibly simple. It's a test used to diagnose psychopathy. And once I wrapped my head around that, I had um, a million other questions. The answers to all of which I hope to find out for myself. I also wanna make it very clear that I'm nervous about making a video about psychopathy and the psychopath test because I wanna make sure the information is correct. We're constantly inundated with TV shows and movies and documentaries about psychos. In fact, since I started making this video and even researching this subject, I've heard everyone I know offhandedly use the phrase psycho. I've even heard myself use it when I said it, a lot. So I began my journey into this subject the best way I know how, by asking BuzzFeed's incredible research team to take several days of their own time to scour the internet and books for credible and reliable information and deliver it to me in an easy to read format for my small brain. Also, in an effort to get real factual information at some point during this video, I will be talking to a legitimate expert. So let's start with what I do know, or at least what the research team told me. The word psychopath originates from the mid to late 1800s and has Greek roots from the words psyche and pathos, meaning sick mind or suffering souls. Back then, psychopathy was considered a type of moral insanity. This changed in the 20th century when a psychiatrist named Hervey Cleckley published The Mask of Sanity, which provided character portraits of psychopaths in his care. He was finding that psychopaths would be released early and often become repeat offenders. They are being released early because of their ability to seem sane. A lot of his work was ignored by the medical community. In the 1960s, the DSM or the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual replaced psychopathic personality with antisocial personality disorder. Antisocial personality disorder, however, is a totally different condition which does not account for some hallmark traits of psychopathy. By the way, this classification still exists today. It's confusing because obviously being diagnosed as one doesn't mean an individual is also the other. Discover Magazine describes psychopaths as people lacking empathy, who often violate social rules and exploit others to get what they want. People with psychopathy make up about 15-20% to of the prison population, often difficult to diagnose and treat, mainly because people with psychopathy tend not to seek out treatment. Enter Dr. Robert Hare, or the reason we're all hair. I hated it when it came out of my mouth. In the 1970s, the Hare Psychopathy Checklist Revised, or the PCLR, was designed as a diagnostic tool that could help measure one's psychopathic or antisocial tendencies. Hare spent over 30 years studying the concept of measurable psychopathy working with prison inmates in Vancouver. A lot of experts in the field consider this the best method for diagnosing psychopathy in an individual. Because of the nature of psychopathy, the PCLR can be used and has been used in courtrooms to assess the risk of becoming repeat offenders. The PCLR consists of an interview section and a review of the subject's past records, during which the administrator assigns points to a number of characteristics and traits. These include things like superficial charm, manipulativeness, impulsivity, and lack of empathy. It's at this point that I'd like to remind you that even if someone you know might exhibit some of these traits, unless you're a licensed doctor, you have no business diagnosing them. Also, spoiler alert, Dr. Hare found that the average person will exhibit some of these traits naturally. Remember, it's a scale. Typically, a score of 30 or higher would result in a diagnosis of psychopathy. Dr. Hare found that while a person with no psychopathic tendencies could score zero, the average person with no criminal background would score about a five. Even Hare considered himself to score a four or five. But okay, I get it. That 25 point differential can go a long way, right? I mean, I actually don't know. So I found someone who does. Dr. Bandy Lee, a forensic psychiatrist and expert on violence at the Yale School of Medicine, Dr. Lee specializes in treating violent offenders and advises on violence prevention through public health approaches. So making a video on the psychopath test or the PCLR, uh, and my main first question is, is that something that's actually used in the field? I refer to it often and I find that it's a good test. One thing I'm seeing is that it, it feels like psychopath doesn't necessarily have a clear definition. It can vary from person to person. Would you mind telling me your definition of the word? I would describe it more in terms of psychopathy uh, because it is not the person, but they are often unable to have empathy or uh, remorse about their actions or even in extreme cases, see other people as human beings. So essentially we should be saying persons with psychopathy as opposed to psychopaths. Right. Elizabeth Howell, a psychoanalyst in New York, has uh, described it very well, I believe, as there being strangers to love. I actually prefer the term sociopathy 
many people can have a certain level of sociopathy in themselves, whereas others uh, may ex exhibit more of it. And it takes a good deal of clinical experience to tell apart what is significant and what is not. So this, this is another thing that I'm not quite understanding. Is sociopath and psychopath the same thing or are they different? Uh, they're used interchangeably, but uh, psychopathy implies more of an in, innate characteristic, whereas sociopathy implies more societal contributions. We know over time that this condition has increased. And as society rewards more sociopathic behaviors and they rise to levels of higher power, they induce conditions in society that, again, facilitate sociopathy. And so I think we do need to look at it more from an ecological perspective. That's actually kind of a game changer. That, like, okay, so the conversation isn't even about the test. It's, it's, it's you know, sociopathy or psychopathy is something that, that might be created by society or at least encouraged. Yes, we're setting up conditions in society that not only reward persons with sociopathic characteristics, but we are also breeding them. In other words, generating these characteristics in people by uh, pitting people against one another in competition so that being less humane and uh, having a strong drive to win at all cost uh, actually rewards people. As we know throughout history, a disproportionate number of leaders of nations have had those and um, have driven their nations to ruin in many cases. Now's a great time to bring up John Ronson, a journalist who spent several years studying the subject, conversing with Dr. Hare, and in 2011 published his book, The Psychopath Test, A Journey Through the Madness Industry. Similarly to what Dr. Lee mentions, Ronson found it troubling that CEOs in the real world might also score highly on the psychopath test. For example, in his book, he details interviews with Al Dunlap, aka Chainsaw Al, the CEO of appliance maker Sunbeam, who is known for his ruthless business practices. He said of that interview, So I turned up at his house, and it was full of sculptures of predatory animals, and he immediately started talking about how he believed in the predatory spirit, which was word for word what Bob Hare writes about in the checklist. Look out for their belief in the predatory spirit. Moreover, he then found that Dunlap was able to completely flip his psychopathic tendencies into positive attributes. He admitted to many, many items on the checklist, but redefined them as leadership positives. So manipulation was another way of saying leadership. Grandiose sense of self-worth was, you know, you've got to like yourself if you're going to be a success. Ronson states that the PCLR is as scientific as it can be, but even in his book, he talks about the dangers of the psychopath test. Ronson writes, I do believe that psychopaths exist and that the nuances of their behavior can come out when somebody is trained to use the checklist. However, an awful lot of people, and Hare himself complains about this, an awful lot of people misuse this checklist and become power crazed. Ronson states that he himself became a little bit power crazed during the writing of the book and began to fancy himself a little bit of a psychopath spotter. But of course, this is dangerous because of the significance of being labeled a psychopath. Ronson found that after being diagnosed, there's virtually nothing a person can do to seem credible. If showing no remorse is a symptom of psychopathy, but also so is manipulativeness, if you start showing remorse, people might think you're just being manipulative. It's a catch-22. Dr. Hare himself questioned the effectiveness of the test in certain circumstances, and there is some evidence to show that the test results vary depending on who administers it. Daniel Murray, a professor of the University of Virginia, studied the test and certain scores used in a court of law. Murray looked at scores administered by psychologists hired by the prosecution, as well as scores administered by psychologists hired by the defense. He found that there were often eight point differences in scores and sometimes up to 20 point differences. So where do we go from there? What is the best method of assessing psychopathy in an individual? And when is it even appropriate to do so? I asked this of Dr. Lee as well. When we look at violence, for example, um, violence is almost impossible to predict on an individual basis. But if we look at societies, we can almost predict to the T what the level of violence will be depending on the societal characteristics. And so I describe it more as a societal disorder than an individual one, because any condition of any individual is ecological. When administering the psychopathy checklist, it is important to place it in context. It's not the end all and be all of any 
aspect of an individual. And so to place it in context of their entire development, their treatment, and uh, their relationship with society, those are all things to consider and not to simply label somebody because of the results of one test. My conversation with Dr. Lee actually changed kind of the point of this video and even the path that I was on. Maybe what we should be focusing on is how we as a society might be labeling people and locking them away as opposed to opening our hearts and understanding what we're doing to create these problems and what we can be doing to stop them. I think that when I started this journey, I might have been a little too focused on the hyper-sensationalized idea of a psychopath. And I think that that might have been the problem and that there's a lot more humanity involved in this scenario and every other scenario than I once thought. I, I know that stereotypes are often damaging, um, whether people fit into them or not. And I think maybe that's something we should all just take a little extra second to think about before we speak or react or judge.